In the last video, I tried to give you a sort of a big picture view of the thermite reaction. And we talked about how the thermite reaction was an analog for building a house. It was a large scale process and when we have enough tools, we'll be able to understand those large scale processes. Actually, I'd like to maybe take an even bigger picture view and ask the question, why know thermodynamics? What's so useful about thermodynamics? And I'll call this video benchmarking thermoliteracy. So you're taking thermodynamics, right? And this is a course that enjoys a certain reputation in higher education. And so if you remember your Dante, even though I'm a chemist, I like to know a little something about classical literature, you might be familiar with Lasciate ogni speranza voi centrate. That's what's inscribed over the gates of hell in the inferno, abandon hope all ye who enter here. But thermodynamics is worth studying, even though it may be complicated, because it's such a powerful and useful tool in chemistry, in physics, in all the physical sciences. The first Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1901 was awarded to Jacobus Henricus van Hoff, whose picture graces this slide, and it was awarded for his contributions to understanding chemical equilibrium. Some of you may actually recognize van Hoff's name. He's also quite well known for being the first to suggest tetrahedral carbon atoms in organic chemistry. But his Nobel Prize is for thermodynamics. So what's a thermodynamic principle that uh, you may even have encountered in prior work? Here's an example of things that people often will look at in a course on thermodynamics. Phase diagrams. So a phase diagram, and the one that's shown here for carbon dioxide, tells you, given a temperature, that's on the x-axis, given a pressure, shown on the y-axis, you can read across and find within this diagram what phase of matter will carbon dioxide be? And so if we pick a particular point here, for instance, this is liquid carbon dioxide. If we go down here to atmospheric pressure, which is about one bar, and we go to uh, a normal temperature, our room temperature, which looks like it's right about here, it's a gas. We know that at one atmosphere, carbon dioxide is a gas. And then we know that it actually comes out as dry ice, as a solid. It goes directly to the solid state when you get close enough. This is all very interesting, but some people look at phase diagrams and might say, yeah, I'm glad somebody knows that, ho-hum. However, understanding the phase diagram for carbon dioxide is critical to actually using carbon dioxide for an economically important process, and that is dry cleaning. So it turns out that fluid carbon dioxide, whether as a liquid or a so-called supercritical fluid, and we'll learn a little bit more about supercritical fluids in the not too distant future, uh, that fluid is useful for removing dirt from clothing, for example. And the virtue of carbon dioxide as a solvent in dry cleaning is that it can replace much less environmentally benign fluids that would otherwise be used, typically, say, a chlorinated uh, hydrocarbon solvent. So it was a chemist who actually developed the use of fluid carbon dioxide for the dry cleaning process. And actually, we've got a picture of him here. His name's Joe DeSimone. At the time that uh, this picture was taken, he was giving a talk at the University of Minnesota in 2003, and his affiliation then was with the University of North Carolina. And he was talking about CO2 technology, that is, how could you use knowledge of supercritical or fluid CO2 in order to do a number of processes, with dry cleaning being one of the most, uh, most economically important examples. So there's some thermodynamics in action in a, a very everyday task. I'd like to tell you another story about thermodynamics, and in this case, I'm going to contrast that with a quote often attributed to P.T. Barnum. Most historians think it should actually go to someone named Hannum. Maybe you know this quote, there's a sucker born every minute. So in 1979, there was an entrepreneur. His name was Joe Newman, and Mr. Newman claimed to have invented an energy machine. And in particular, the virtue of this machine was no matter how much energy you put in, you would get more energy out. You would create energy. So certainly this was something that was worth investing in. 
It does turn out that the first law of thermodynamics, and we'll be discussing the laws of thermodynamics, says perpetual motion machines are not allowed, which is another way of saying you can't get more energy out than you put in. And the United States Patent Office adopts a similar philosophy. So in the 1980s, it turns out that elected officials spent a lot of tax money trying to decide which of these two mutually contradictory statements, I have a machine that creates more energy than you put into it, or the first law of thermodynamics, could be true. So in 1911, the U.S. Patent Office adopted a policy, and it says if you claim to have patented a perpetual motion machine, you need actually to deposit it with the patent office for at least a year, and they will look at it, and if they decide it is a perpetual motion machine, and they never have, then they'll give you a patent. But Newman filed suit against the patent office and claimed that his energy machine wasn't really a perpetual motion device, and so that regulation did not apply. A judge who was appointed to hear the case, Judge Thomas Penfield Jackson, decided he did not have enough knowledge of thermodynamics himself, so he appointed a special master, a former commissioner of patents, William Schuyler, to investigate the machine. And to the surprise of the court, Schuyler's report came back and said, no question about it, Newman's energy machine, it's fabulous. Output of energy is greater than input. The judge was not entirely persuaded, so he taught himself a bit of physics. God bless. Uh, eight months later, he decided that Schuyler's report had to be erroneous. And in support of his position, he cited the laws of thermodynamics. So those aren't laws on the statute books, but they're pretty important laws. Uh, he advised that the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States could look at the machine, but Newman's attorneys refused. And media attention to the case led to a United States member of Congress, Representative Bob Livingston, a Republican from Louisiana, hearing media reports and deciding that Newman was clearly being unfairly treated, an abuse of power by the patent office, and together with six members of Congress, he uh, sought a private relief bill that would force the patent office to issue a patent to Newman. So Congress did what it does in the United States, it held hearings. And an expert from the Na National Bureau of Standards, that's what NIST was called back in those days, uh, John Lyons testified before the committee and he said various things, but fundamentally he came down to, you can't get more energy out than goes in and that's the first law of thermodynamics. Newman was next to testify and unperturbed by uh, the NBS expert, he cited Schuyler's report, and he did what a salesman does. He sold the device to members of the Senate panel. And one of the members of that panel was Senator John Glenn, shown here in, the, uh, in an astronaut's outfit. Those of you who remember John Glenn will remember he was an astronaut. A uh, Democrat from Ohio brought a little bit of reason to the proceedings, but not actually as a physical scientist. And in particular, Senator Glenn asked Newman, if he had known William Schuyler before he'd been appointed by the court as a special master. And Newman was a bit flustered and said, thinks they met once before, but it was unlikely Schuyler would remember that. At which point Glenn pointed out it was in fact Schuyler's patent law firm that had represented Newman to the patent office for the original filing. And at that point, all the senators began sliding back from the table, sound of chairs sliding. And that's the end of this story. So it's a bit unfortunate from my perspective that these senators in the United States Congress uh, were mostly lawyers and not really swayed by a violation of the first law of thermodynamics, but they certainly did understand conflict of interest, and that's what ended this case. Clearly, more scientific literacy, if you will, thermodynamic literacy within society at large would be a welcome contribution. So let me talk about my goals for this course and what I hope are your goals for the course as well. Let's learn how the universe really works. 
And that's what thermodynamics does. It provides us a set of tools to make predictions about how the universe works. And I hope to provide you with some of those tools. We won't have time to develop all of them, perhaps, but at least some fundamental and useful ones. A sub-goal is to end up smarter than most politicians. And of course, the more difficult goal here admittedly is first, but that's enough snarkiness in this video. Let me tell you about what the course is going to look like. So there will be video lectures, just like these. And for many of the lectures, there will be self-assessments embedded within them. And when you take these self-assessments, you will be able to click on a little button, explanation, that will tell you why the correct answer to the self-assessment is what it is. And we'll see that uh, maybe in two videos from now. I also will have some additional demonstrations. So if you were drawn into the course by that wonderful thermite reaction, hopefully there will be one or two others that are equally as exciting. And there will be a few that maybe won't necessarily explode or catch fire, but are still pretty interesting and illustrate key thermodynamic concepts. So we'll salt those throughout the course as well. Every week, at the end of the week, there will be a homework assignment. And those will be available two weeks ahead and one week past the individual week in question, after which they'll be graded. There are 10 questions each, and each of the questions is worth 10 points. So each homework will be worth 100 points, and there will be eight of them, one for each of the eight weeks when content will be presented within the course. There will be a final exam at the end of the course, and that exam will be worth 200 points. And passing in this course will constitute 60% or more of the possible 1,000 points. So that's 600 points or more. And that brings us to the end of the thermal literacy uh, video, as well as explaining what the course is going to look like. In the next lecture that we see, we're going to address a critical physical phenomenon that's going to let us derive some of the tools that we're going to use in computing thermochemical quantities, and that is the quantization of energy that describes how energy is stored in microscopically small systems.